sort of transition episode of Views from the Dricks. We're going to be having some uh, Hendricks College athletics coaches and personnel on. Today we've got Hendricks College head women's tennis coach, Maggie Dabity. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so if you want to start off and just kind of tell our, uh, our viewers, um, you know, where you're from, kind of your experience with tennis and what, what brought you here. Yeah. So I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and go Tigers. Um, I decided to go to Millsaps because, honestly, it was the only school that reached out to me to play college tennis. So it was kind of one of those things that was like, go for it or regret it for a good bit. So I went for it, and I went from kind of enjoying the sport to really fully immersing myself into tennis. I was obsessed with being a part of the team. I think even from a freshman uh, my freshman year, I took uh, my role as, on the team as something very important to me. I wanted to be like the on-court leader, but I also loved like being super close with my teammates off the court. So I think I just was like, wow, I think this is something I can really see myself doing and um, pushing myself on the tennis court, but also like gaining leadership skills throughout like my college experience. So I think that's what really kickstarted me really loving the team aspect and because tennis is such an individual sport I think going into college it was like something super new to me so I think that was something cool that I learned just from freshman year and then going forward I was a captain my junior and senior year and then I ended up playing a fifth year getting my master's and we ended up winning the conference tournament that year winning going on to nationals and I think that was the coolest experience in all five years of playing tennis <laughs> so was it always something that you knew you wanted to do in college or was it something that just kind of no I don't think I started looking for schools until November of my senior year so it was definitely something I'd never really spoke about just because I didn't I grew up in Baton Rouge and like LSU was the only really avenue everyone in my family went to LSU so I didn't really explore any options and going to a tournament that's when I got in contact with the Millsaps coach and I just it opened my eyes to D3 sports in general I was very I didn't know much about it so I think it was kind of just wow this seems like a great fit for me I'm gonna get a great education why not go for this right okay yeah. so and, and education wise got a degree in accounting mm -hmm. and then ended up studying for you know getting, getting yeah. your master's right um so you know can, can you maybe speak a little bit on on yeah. the the kind of student athlete life and your experience doing that I think it was super cool going to a small school because I was able to push myself I mean you couldn't you know going to Hendrix you can't just sit in class and doodle or play on your computer because the teacher can call on you any second and you're with 12 other students especially in accounting the higher up the class it's got the smaller the classes we're getting so I think I was just pushing myself and then also enjoying my professors the classes and then also another draw to accounting I don't know if y'all do this at Hendrix but your senior year is um, the spring is an internship so I was able to do an accounting internship while also playing tennis. And I didn't have any classes that semester. So it was just the internship, which was super cool because I got an insight of like, this is the semester where I'm about to graduate. What am I getting myself into work-wise? Mm -hmm. So I worked at a public accounting firm in Jackson and then was also doing tennis in the afternoon. So it was the best of both worlds. <laughs> and it was a super cool experience but it also kind of gave me a little insight of public accounting is really isolating <laughs> <laughs> right right so it was a little snippet of what after college was like and I loved accounting but it got me thinking of what else I could do right well so that's kind of a perfect segue into this you know you're talking about kind of the leadership aspect of <laughs> the leadership aspect of, of you know playing college tennis and uh, I was kind of wondering, is that one of the things that sort of pushed you into coaching was was that sort of leadership role and, and having that on your, your college team? 
Yeah, I definitely. So my um, coach, my junior, senior, and masters, he was our assistant coach my sophomore year, and he was also a young coach. So, I mean, he taught us so much, but he also was um, – we communicate a lot with him just being kind of close in age with him and understanding his role. And then from a player to a coach kind of immediately after college. And I thought that was super cool because it seemed like he had it all going on. But when I would have like closer conversations with him, he would be like, yeah, this is just like tough managing two teams. Cause he was the head coach of the men's and the women's team. So I just, I loved his enthusiastic like personality. He loved coaching us. He made our experience so amazing and I think I more of like out of tennis I'm not like the loudest person in the room I'm not going to be telling people what to do but I think I always saw like highlights of myself while I was in that like team aspect of people looking up to me and kind of being assertive and knowing what I think was best for the team so I do think I always in the back of my head in college was like wow I I think I'm my most confident self when I'm in this leadership role on the court, whether it be on the tennis court or leading them in like workouts or just like overall team morale was where I kind of like gained my confidence. So my fifth year, I wasn't even able really to go to practice all the time because I was getting my master's and we had night classes, but I always just felt like so like so a part of the team knowing that they respected me. They knew I wasn't going to slack just because I was in night classes. So I think that was a different role while also playing. Um, I asked my coach at first, I was like, I'm going to come back, but I want to be the grad assistant. And he was like, okay, okay. Yeah, that's great. Like, we'd love to have you. And then like a day later he called me and he was like, we have not lost. Like I was the only senior. Well, I had another senior that year but I was the only senior in the lineup and he was like I think we could have the same exact team if not better if you would just come on and play and so I wanted to play but also have like a different role so I think that was a cool year to transition and then yeah I always I told my coach all the time I was like when you're leaving you know the person to call I just I knew I wanted to coach I just didn't know how to get into it right right well and so you were working in Dallas, right, mm-hmm. after you, you graduated, um, doing accounting stuff. Yeah. Um, h- how did you find out about the job at Hendricks? H- how did you get plugged in here? So um, I was super close with both my college coaches. I looked up to them a lot. I admired their coaching style, them as people. So um, whenever there was, like, a kind of a lull in the Millsaps coaching, they didn't have a coach for, like, six months. I kind of toyed around with the idea and asked them, like, is this crazy that I'm thinking I could be a head coach? Like, right now I don't even have any assistant experience. And they just were like, do it. Like, go for it. They vouched for me. They were super encouraging. And then Craig, they're super close with Craig. And so I think word of where got out that I wasn't looking at this point. That was, like, almost a year later. But I just had one conversation with Craig, and I think his view on a program aligned with mine, and I we just had a great conversation, and he was just encouraging me to come take a visit, talk to Coach Weaver, and I just think everything Craig has done with the program is everything I would have wanted in a program. So I think it just was like a perfect storm, and Coach Weaver was amazing, and I just think I can learn from a lot of people here, and with Craig already – taking the program so far I think it was just a perfect scenario to walk into right okay yeah absolutely um so how has it been kind of taking the reins of the program and that being your first really big experience in coaching because I having stepped into to being an assistant on the baseball team here for you know a semester being that young and getting into it I, I can't even begin to imagine how it's been on that end of things, being a a head coach of a college program. Yeah. Um, It definitely was intimidating at first, but I knew I just had to jump in with confidence, knowing that I I can do this. I see myself being a coach forever. So I really just knew this was a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and don't mess it up. Um, I think it helped. All the girls are so respectful, but I knew, like, from day one, the first thing I needed to do was just gain the respect 
of all the players, it didn't help that they all loved Craig. So I knew I had to, I wasn't coming into a program where they hated their coach and anyone was better. So I knew I had to win them over. And I'm, they're a young team too. And I think they were just all eager to learn, listen, and knew that I wanted what was best for them. So I think the fall, I really just wanted to get a personal relationship with each girl on the team. And then I, I feel like we really hit the ground running and they all are super eager to learn. They want to get better. They want to be a winning team. So I think it just all worked out super well. Absolutely. So is it is it kind of strange being so recently removed from your own playing career and being in the shoes of the, the athletes that you're coaching, you know, and kind of trying to balance that, like, being friendly and, and being being a presence for them and, and also being their coach. Yeah. I definitely want to be relatable, but I think setting boundaries was what I needed to do at first, just knowing that I was the coach, not – I mean, I want to be their friend, but there just has to be certain boundaries that are set that can build a coaching experience for them. But I don't think I really struggled with that at all just because I think – I walked into a great group of girls that were super respectful and wanted to take the program to the next level. So I think they wanted to put in the work as well as letting me do its best for them. I always tell them I'm a resource. I won't, if the work they're putting in, I'll put in more. So I'm available all the time. Whoever wants to hit, whoever wants to get better, I'm just always there to be that person for them. Whether it's like hitting outside of practice, having conversations outside of practice, I just think being available is the best thing and having a structured schedule is really what will take this program to the next level. Absolutely. And so you you talked about your coaches at Millsaps and and how kind of influential they've been in you, you know, your career and getting into coaching. I mean, do you you have resources like that still? Do you Mm -hmm. reach out to these people and talk to them all the time? Yeah. I talk to my my coach, coach. He's Coach Davis. He's at Swarthmore, actually, with um, the first coach I had, Coach Box. So they started together when I was there, and now they're both at Swarthmore together. And then my best friend, Grace Gaskins, who played with me at Millsaps, she's also the DBU grad assistant. So we have, like, a group text that goes off all the time just talking about different things, advice, different matches. So, I mean, I couldn't have imagined having that – right now just because it's something that it's not like talking to Craig or which me and Craig talk all the time but it's cool to just have outside perspectives and people that are in the coaching world too not only D3 but DBU is a D2 school but still experiencing the same kind of um, things with coaching and players and matches so that's really fun absolutely Um, so now you know being sort of still sort of new to Conway um, and, and Hendricks, how has that experience been? I mean, kind of coming in here and sort of hitting the ground running, of course, work-wise, but, you know, how, how has your experience been in terms of, like, Hendricks? Yeah. Well, I really thought Conway was going to be this really small town, but I I think it's great. I mean, Little Rock is right there. There's so much to do, outdoorsy stuff, hiking, and – I got fortunate enough knowing a roommate that was moving to Conway at the same time. So I wasn't like completely alone, but I think everyone at Hendricks is so welcoming and warm and I never felt like a stranger. I didn't feel isolated. So I think all of that has made the experience super great. Yeah. 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 No, it's kind of funny how much there is to do in a, in a place like this yeah. because I came here from a pretty big city and, was expecting it to be like one one thing in town to do, and there's yeah. I mean there's so much, and then there's also a lot of a lot of wonderful people here. So many wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> the people make the place, and they I really think do. Hendrix has some great people. Certainly, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So now you know we're a handful of matches into the season, um, you know, and and I've had the opportunity to to work the broadcasts and, and watch a couple of them. Yeah, maybe share some of your thoughts on on how that's going, what you're seeing. Of course, it seems like there's been a pretty big shift in the uh, kind of the, the culture of the program and in playing some really competitive matches. Yeah, um, 
talking about being a new coach, I think the one thing that has been different is my emotions, I think, might be heightened being a coach rather than a player. So that's been something where it's been a great thing, but also something I've I've needed to check more than I thought I would have to. So we had a great start winning 8-1 against Ozarks, who we played in the fall. And that was a match where I thought they could have some sneaky wins where I was like, we it's the first match, we can't have any hiccups, it needs to be clean. And that was where I was like, okay, well, these girls have improved tremendously from the fall. Because I don't think that was the same result we would have gotten in the fall. So that was a super cool um, win. And then we played OBU and Harding, which are great D1 programs. And we com- we were competing hard. I just think that level of play is, is kind of hard to, um, to get some wins on. But I, I still think they were fighting hard and – it was great for me to see them play players at that level. And then we had two close losses that I thought were definitely winnable matches. And it just came down to, I think, matchups, um, doubles. Doubles were struggling a little bit because I think we all have – we have eight players, and I think they're all eight great doubles players. So just finding the perfect combo of teams is – something that I'm just working on. It's still early in the season. That's what I keep telling them. And I think we have a good one and two, and I'm just waiting for maybe one or two players to step up and want to take that three spot. Cause I, I do think the one and two player are not necessarily going to be the one doubles team, so forth and so on. I think it kind of takes chemistry, understanding doubles. And I think that will come. So that's something I think we can improve on going forward. Um, But the two losses were definitely tough at first, but they took those. We're able to get a good win against Webster. So I think we're just slowly improving. And now we have Texarkana A&M Saturday and then our first um, conference match on Sunday against Rhodes. It's exciting. Super exciting. (laughs) So, uh, you know, what, what has been the, the biggest challenge stepping into this, this coaching role and, and now you're a little bit into the season have kind of gotten a, a feel for some of this stuff. What are, what are some of the big challenges that you've, you've kind of faced? Maybe things you expected, maybe things you didn't? Um, I would say they're all, like, I come from a program where one of our big strengths was our encouragement and enthusiastic personalities on the court. And I, I want that to be Hendrick's tennis. So I think just showing them how to express them, their emotions in a positive way, encouraging each other, looking like they're having a lot of fun, which they are probably, they're having so much fun, but I think we can, that's something we can take to the next level. And that's just something that's, I can't really force on, but I mean, they're definitely getting better. Like the last match, Eleanor was like, okay, each game, This is going to be a simple request. I want everyone to have like a, let's go majors. I mean, sorry, let's go cut that one out. (laughs) Let's go warriors. Just something to encourage each other on the court because playing singles, it can be so individualistic. And I think sometimes the players are not aware of their negative emotions affecting the people next to them. And also your opponents, your opponents can be, lagging like getting the ball slowly so sometimes you the players can take that on Mm -hmm. so I think just being aware on the court and how your body language and positive attitude can affect not only your opponent but the players next to you yeah and if you're down on yourself that only encourages your opponent to be okay I've got this this is going to be a great match for me so I think that's one thing I've really tried to show them not like they're not wanting to change it's just something you have to get used to and it takes practice certainly yeah no I, it's amazed me and what i've seen of of you know tennis so far this year how mental of a game yeah that is i mean how much is going on upstairs and and how much that really contributes to to whether someone's winning or losing is is you know the the body language and the kind of energy that they bring mm-hmm. and you know i i didn't expect it going in there and, and streaming tennis you know the 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 kind of encouraging each other and, and the talking and stuff because mm-hmm. I'd always thought of tennis as a very yeah. like and I'm probably quiet. the loudest one I need yeah. to turn it down yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 
you know, kind of talking along the same lines of, of some of these things that you have implemented to kind of change the culture and, and improve the program, you know, wanting to make a, a career in coaching, what is the long-term vision for this program at Hendricks for you? I think we're, this is a great starting year. I mean, I think it's only up from this building a culture that is winning. The players are invested while also wanting to leave a legacy of the Hendrix tennis program, like wanting it to be better than where they found it. And I think that's just like dialing in to these players and let it like they need to buy in on what we're trying to do with the program, which I think we've done. So I, I see endless possibilities for the program. I really do with our facilities too. I think a lot of schools struggle with not having an indoor facility. I was talking to someone the other day. I don't think we would have had practice in the past, like, month i think we would have practiced like five days out of the past month if we didn't have our indoor courts which is huge yeah yeah well and that's that's one of the things i feel like hendrix has always done really well is is having access to facilities yeah. like that um and i i feel like outside of colleges having those it, it would be really tough yeah to to not i mean yeah i don't know of any indoor tennis facilities anywhere around here outside of ours here at Hendricks. No, yeah. It, it, yeah. I couldn't imagine. I think it would have just been a whole different battle getting people ready for matches without practice. So right. I'm very grateful for the indoor courts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, stepping into to coaching, like you have, of course, we've talked about it a little bit. Some of the, the kind of uh, logistical administrative duties, yeah. are there things that have mm -hmm. kind of surprised you? Um, I think recruiting has surprised me just cause you could contact a hundred people and get like three people to respond back. So I think just broadening and finding different ways to contact recruits, I think is something that I need to work on and brainstorm and find different ways. Cause I mean, not all seniors in high school are checking their emails or not putting their phone numbers up, but expecting coaches to reach out. So I think I just need to get creative with different ways to approach recruiting. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things. I love admin stuff. So I've, I've liked the getting the vans, having to find Airbnbs. All, all of that stuff is fun to me. But I do think I need to get creative with finding recruits and getting them in contact and on campus. I think once recruits come on campus, meet the team, I'm able to meet with them. I have, I feel way more comfortable with that rather than just like trying to communicate with someone and getting a, Oh, maybe I'll come on campus. So I think getting recruits on campus is huge. Yeah, no. And I, I think that's probably a really big selling point, especially for a place like Hendricks yeah. because it's a gorgeous campus, great yeah. facilities. And, I'm like, and come to the bubble. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's one thing to, to see something like that in, in pictures or, you know, Google it online, but like, that's that's one of the the biggest draws for Hendrix is is how awesome of a campus this is and the yeah. facility, and I, I'm sure that that's that's a big thing to be able to get somebody here because I I mean I being recruited to come play baseball here I was like ah you know it's it looks cool online whatever set foot on campus and it's just total a totally different experience yeah. you know and, and that's a huge selling yeah. point. How did you feel as a um, player student athlete having? one side of campus be academics, the other side being all the sports stuff. I thought it was pretty awesome. Yeah. I, uh, you know, kind of physically forces you to balance your life, of course, you know, and manage your time well. And, and I felt like having that kind of separation there was really cool. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was an interesting experience for sure. I thought it was wild. Like it's literally separated by the street. Like you have to walk under the, bridge or over the bridge like it is separated yes yes physically physically separated yeah. um and, and i think that that's kind of interesting especially at a place like hendrix here because of you know you know the the percentage of students at the school who are student athletes you know mm -hmm. um you've got i want to say it's 40 some odd percent of the the student population who are athletes and they're yeah. you know coming back and forth on a daily basis and that's you know very different from how it is at, at Millsaps, mm -hmm. you know because have, having traveled there for baseball and everything's kind of on, yeah. on campus there, and, and mm -hmm. it definitely, uh, definitely different than a lot of a lot of schools. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think we're going to take a quick break. 
We'll be right back. All right. Now we're back. Actually back. Um, okay, so Maggie, tell us a little bit about about the team this year, you know, some of the personalities, the leadership dynamic, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So in the fall, I wasn't prepared to have a, have captains this early, but I was able to name captains in the fall because I just felt like I was going to need some time to really get to know everyone and see who's going to step up and really take the role as team captain seriously. But in the fall, I was able to name um, Emma, who's a sophomore. She's team captain, and so is Avery. Um, she's a junior, and I think they, from just – day one took me aside were super encouraging about what they wanted from the program what they thought I was going to do with the program so I think that was just easy as like I saw the vision they wanted and they which also aligned with what I wanted to do so I think they've really stepped up they communicate well with the team they're always the ones in practice getting people encouraged if people are talking too much I'm never the one that's like come on y'all they're always the ones to step in and just get everyone motivated and ready for practice, matches, whatever it is. They pick the uniforms. I, I really feel like all the little things, they have it handled, which is super cool because I, I don't want to have to micromanage the team as well as be their coach. So I think having them has been huge. So that was really cool. And then Eleanor, who's a junior also, she's been abroad. So her coming back, she's really – stepped up this spring too so I think people look up to her as well and I always tell them I'm not someone who's gonna want two people in charge of a team I think everyone should be held holding each other accountable I just think me naming captains is rewarding for the players but I also said if there's a hole you see in the program someone just needs to step up and fill it I think Everyone needs to do their, their job. There needs to be leaders, there needs to be followers, and there needs to be people in the middle. So I think everyone has done a good job, like, finding their place and either stepping up. Like, Campbell is a freshman. I see her doing a lot of leadership things now. So I, I don't think people see the captains and just think what they say goes. So I, I think everyone works together and hold, holds each other accountable. Absolutely. That, yeah. That's a solid dynamic to have for yeah. sure. Um, okay, so – Maggie, one of the things that we talked about during the break was, you know, kind of shuffling around lineups and, and some of the, you know, various pieces in, in certain places since, you know, since the season started. Uh, maybe you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So with tennis, you have six people that play singles, six people that play doubles. And it's not – you don't have to pick – someone doesn't have to play doubles, whatever. So I think matchup-wise was a struggle a little bit just because I think – we have some great doubles players. We have big servers, big returners, big volleyers. So I think we have a lot of surplus of that. But picking between one, two, and three doubles, there is a different dynamic playing each line. So I think I went in wanting to have a big one doubles, but that could also have been Campbell and Avery, biggest serves on the team, biggest volleys on the team. So I tried that matchup. And I think just also understanding that making one team super strong could also be harmful in the overall doubles lineup. So now I'm going with Avery and Eleanor, who's a strong baseliner at one. Avery, huge volleyer. And I think that matchup has been super great because Eleanor can hold her own with anyone from the baseline. And Avery has some of the best footwork and volleys, serves, on the team. So I'm really excited about that matchup. And I think they've wanted to get better, learn a lot. They've done different formations, trying to figure out ways to show their strengths while hiding their weaknesses. So they've been wanting to learn and work on stuff with that. And then we have um, at two doubles, we have Josie, who's a freshman, and Emma, a sophomore. And they were actually SAA player doubles team of the week a couple weeks ago. They're super solid. I think they work well together because they play similar game styles. So that's another way that matchups can be great is players understanding the other player. So there is super different dynamics like Avery and Eleanor, 
who have completely different game styles, but they work together because they highlight each other's strengths. Whereas Josie and Emma, I think, are great because they play the same. So that's been super cool to see. And they've won a ton of matches. I think they've only lost against Harding and OBU. So they've only lost two matches this season. They are super solid doubles team. And then with three, I have four players that could fill that role. So it's just kind of waiting for a team to step up. And I think Campbell will definitely be at three huge serves, huge volleys. So that bodes well for a doubles player. So I think we have so many great options, and it's kind of fun just to play with the different dynamics on the team. And I'm excited for Rhodes because I think that will be a real show of where we're at in doubles. Right, yeah. And so kind of as we're getting closer to being in conference play, um, you know, and you're, you're getting getting a feel for the girls and how they play. Um, you know, what what are some of the the – kind of teams that you I'm trying to <laughs> figure out how to phrase this um you know l looking at what you guys have and, and what's out there in the rest of the conference because i'm sure you guys you know have scouting report sort of things um you know what, what does that look like i definitely am an optimistic person so i think i'm gonna i think tennis is a sport where anyone can win it any given day and i tell them that all the time I never will ever go into a match telling them that this team is better than us so I think I will approach every single conference match of it's anyone's day any given day of the week I think doubles is huge because it is not necessarily who's the better tennis player it's who's the better team because it's very much so like who's going to be mentally tough that day who can get to the net first whereas singles is a little bit more of you can show people's weaknesses. So I, I think I've taken the approach of we need to really capitalize on doubles. If we go up 3-0, that's huge in any conference. You only need two other singles points. So I think my goals are is to get to the doubles where I think it needs to be because I think that's where we will have the edge just because we do have great servers, great volleyers, and I, I think – there are several chances we can go up 3-0. But I I say we can beat anyone on any given day, so I really don't tell them teams that I expect them to beat and don't expect them to beat because I never right. want them to go in with a defeated mindset. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's really solid. And, you know, w with it being as, as mental of a game as it is, I think that's uh, that's got to be super yeah. important, you know, having having that expectation. Um you know, and you've talked a lot about kind of the, the mental side of the game and how important mm -hmm. that sort of stuff is. Um, you know, is that uh, is that different from a, a coaching perspective how, as, as to how it was as a player, you know, kind of the mental side of the game? Yeah, I think it has helped because I do think I was mentally tough as a player, but I, I did have emotions. It wasn't like I was – the ice queen where I didn't feel anything, but I, I do think I gave myself tools to overcome the nerves, the anticipation of, oh, I'm better than this person. I should automatically be beating this person because in tennis, you really do on paper know if you're better or worse than your opponent. So I think going into matches and not having the expectation of I should be losing, I should be winning is something that I've tried to eliminate from their mindset, just not having that like I said, again, that defeated mindset. But I think each player is different. But I'm very strategy-based. I think you need to exploit your opponent's weaknesses. I think a lot of times since tennis is an individual sport, the players can focus more on what they're doing rather than what their opponent is doing wrong. So a lot of times I'll go to a court and someone's like, my forehand's not working today, and, and I'm just like, no. Your forehand's fine. Y'all are all great tennis players. Like, let's let's sit down, breathe, and what is what is your opponent not doing right? Like, have they made approach shots? Are they missing their volleys? Like, we need to think about exploiting their weaknesses, not focusing on what we're doing wrong. I think that's the biggest thing in tennis. Strategy-based is how you're going to be a better doubles and singles player. So I think that's what I I really try to bring to them and not – oh, you, your timing's off. Like, I, I don't think in a match talking about technical tennis things does anyone good ever. Right, Yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, so 
I mean, it sounds like you're, you're doing a, a really solid job of, of trying to implement some of these things um, and not, not trying to actually implement some of these things, you know, the, 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 the approach and stuff like that. And, of course, I, Sandy and I have these conversations all the time about, you know, the mental sides of baseball and, and, and football. Um, and that's one of the things that I've always been fascinated by is the, the level of carryover sport to sport on some of these things. Um, you know, and, and you're talking about the, the, the mindset of, you know, going out and expecting to win or going out and expecting to, you know, expecting to not. And, you know, it's the same thing on the, on the mound. Yeah. If I was out there expecting to go carve guys up, I'd get shelled or, yeah. you know, had, had no idea where the ball was going. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like Sandy talking about kicking, there's a lot of kind of that same thing, the, the sort of, you know, man in the arena, right. you know, yeah. all eyes are on you sort of uh, experience. Um, and it, it's kind of, fascinating the the way that you know that that's the exact same across the board and especially in tennis um yeah have there been things that you've kind of run into with trying to change the mindset um of the program so far that that have kind of given you given you issues kind of little hiccups here and there i don't think so but i would say from a tennis standpoint and just the way i run practices might be a little different like this is kind of technical with tennis, but I always tell them, I don't care how hard you can hit the ball, and I don't care how many winners you can hit. You can hit 50 winners, but make 50 on four errors, and the match is even. So I think in practice, I am i don't want to see stupid balls being missed. Like I want everyone to be super intentional with their warm-up, with the, the practices we're doing, the drills we're doing. So I think really taking things serious and understanding like each point means a lot I think that's something that I'm slowly getting better at like explaining and showing them like I do this 35 ball drill probably 24 7 like every single day they're always like 35 ball drill but they've grown to love it and now they're starting to understand what it is like they used to do it so it's basically where two people are on one side one person is on the other side and they're the the one person is trying to get the 35 balls in the court and they used to take like 10 tries to get 35 balls but I'm like the point of this drill is maybe to have one or two like rallies and this person being able to get 35 balls because it's not how hard you can hit the ball how fast how many winners you can hit there's two people on the the other side you're not gonna hit a winner on them so I think it's just taking those little things and then implementing them into their matches like when they get nervous I look at them I'm like 35 balls so it's just little things they can keep in their back pocket that they're like, oh, I can do this. Because you can break down any op- opponent knowing you're not, if they think, this girl doesn't miss. And that's something that takes mental toughness is just being able to wear down your opponent, not striking the ball too soon and being able to just stay in the rallies a little bit longer. I think that is all the mental side of tennis. Because it's so easy to just – want to take a chance because you're tired or you think you have the right shot but patience and knowing how to structure a point goes a long way and I think that's what I'm slowly trying to implement in practices and matches right so you know with with that do you find that the majority of the stuff that you kind of run in in practices is focused more so on like kind of the, the the mental side of the game and not making these mental errors yeah. Okay. For sure. I I don't feed a whole lot. I don't think that helps. I try to implement match play and just like little things that will help during a match because these are college players. They've already learned as much technical stuff as they can. I mean, of course, I'm going to show them how to maybe get more power on their forehand, volleys, whatever. But I think everything we need, are doing in practice needs to be point-based and how it can help them in matches. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that I've really appreciated about kind of watching tennis and, and, and kind of thinking of these things, you know, as a, as a, as a baseball coach myself, it's really hard to get, you know, like in game reps, Mm -hmm. you know, whereas I think with tennis, that's something that, you know, you can, you can go hit with somebody any day of the week. Mm -hmm. Um, Does that, does that kind of make it easier coming up with like practice plans and stuff? Totally. Yeah. I think, especially right now, since we've we've hit a stride in the season where I really think everyone's knocked all their rest off from 
the off season. So I try to get as much match play as you can because the worst thing I can hear first when someone walks off the court is I play so much better in practice. Like that is my biggest pet peeve because I think people should be practicing like they're playing. And if they're not getting that nervousness or not feeling that intensity in practice, then what's the point? Because they're not going to be able to perform like they're expected to. So I always try to have those pressure games, whether it be tiebreakers or serving games where the, the servers up 30 love, just putting those pressure points on them, doing a lot of move up, move down drills. So just implementing and trying to replicate those feelings and emotions you get in a match right. during practice. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh that's awesome. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really awesome. Um, you know, and that's, that's not, uh, not, not an easy thing to do in, in just about any other sport. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's really cool that that's a, an option, you know? Yeah. Um, so having, being a, a very young coach, having been pretty fresh off of your own playing career, um, you know, I, how was the experience of like structuring practices and stuff where, were you kind of just digging through the, the, the mental archive of practices that you went through and, and finding things that you want to implement? Is that kind of how, how totally. the approach is? Yeah. Craig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I use him a lot. I always walk up to his practices and I'm like, what are you doing? What's this drill? So, yeah, I mean, just playing junior tennis and college tennis, I think there's, like, a bunch of drills in the back of my mind. But I also have coaches that I still talk to, my old players. I asked all of them, not my old players, my old teammates, what were y'all's favorite drills? What did y'all think were stupid? And I, of course, have a few that I can think of where I was like, why are we doing this? But – as a coach, I'm like, no, I think I think that was necessary, and I had the wrong mindset as a player. So I think there's just there's a lot to to do that I want to keep doing. So I don't I haven't struggled with that yet, but I I do think a timing issue is always a thing, and finding which days I should do what, like kind of making sure I'm doing everything at least once a week. So I think that was kind of like the hardest thing, writing it down and being like, okay, when's the last time we've done a doubles cross-court drill or making sure they're serving every day is kind of the biggest thing for me, serving and returning. Right. Um, you can't start a point without either one of those. So I think highlighting that has been what I've, the last three weeks, a lot of serves and returns. Yeah, It's tedious and not super fun to do, but I try to show them how important it is and, especially after a match if I've noticed majority of the silly points they were losing were off of serves and returns. I just want to show, like, you're beating yourself at that point. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's that's one of the things that I've really picked up on as being a, a big mental part of the game is, is the serve. Yeah. You know, and watching it myself as a, as a former pitcher, I, I see it very much in that, that yeah. sort of context. Um, and that's uh, – just the, the level of athleticism that goes into that, a good serve and a good return, yeah. is wild. Yeah. And you're you're combining a really physically challenging thing with, I mean, it's also very mentally challenging, yeah. you know? And, and I think that's that's just insane to watch. Yeah. Um, so you talk about Craig, and, and, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, talk about a little, a little bit of the, I mean, kind of mentorship dynamic and how he's been in, in sort of coaching you in terms of coaching. Yeah, he has been great. I mean, my the schedule, he had already done the schedule, so that was something I didn't have to deal with. But at the same time, he's kind of walked me through the process of like a week before a match, he always lets me know he contacts whoever we're playing that Monday, and he's like, this is the rundown. Or if we're traveling somewhere, he'll still contact the them on Monday being like we plan to be there at two so that's something that I don't think I thought of and now I'm doing it every week he's probably doing it for me too but I'm also on top of them texting the the coaches so I think he's a great communicator with other coaches and he seems to know everyone so that's been super cool and a blessing for me just because I only really know the people that I've played of which are in our conference and we have way more matches than just our conference. So that's 
he's been helping me so much with that. And also just recruiting. He's an amazing recruiter. He has taken me to the Arkansas tournament, um, the high school tournament. So just like having his connections and seeing how he does things has really kind of helped me and made me feel comfortable of like stepping into the role. And he's always wanting to help me if I have any questions, even like if we're in a match and he's always like, I don't want to step on your toes. And I'm like, Craig, I don't think there will be in any world where I won't take your advice one or two that I'll get mad at you for saying something to one of the players. So he's just like overly respectful and not wanting to do anything without my approval whenever I'm like, no, Craig, you do, you are allowed to do whatever you want. I respect you and I trust your opinion. So that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and so I, I think totally lost my train of thought there. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's going to have to get cut out. Goodness. <laughs> good, uh, good B roll right there. Goodness. Um, you look serious too. You're like, well, yeah, I mean, it's just big head, no thoughts. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about tennis side of things. Um, you know, the, the coaching, the experience of coaching. I'll get more into to the Hendrick side of things. I mean, you've been around campus and around the athletic facilities. What is your favorite spot at Hendrix? Oh, gosh. Independent of the tennis bubble. Okay. <laughs> oh. Maybe this is hard. It's all so pretty. Right, right. I think just like walking on the I, – I honestly have – I've only – like a handful of times when I'm walking recruits around, there's not really a reason for me to go to that other side besides to the calf, mm -hmm. walking recruits. I just think the campus is really pretty, and I like the way that it's – I feel like some colleges, one building might look completely different the next. Like everything looks like it fits in a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. So I think aesthetically, the campus is just beautiful. Okay, yeah. I like, yeah. The, I like the bridge that goes over the tennis courts. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Yeah. 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 Well, and the uh, the outdoor tennis courts recently resurfaced. resurfaced. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's solid. I like that. See, I like the uh I really like that bridge and I really liked it as a player because I would walk across that every single morning on my way to breakfast after weights because that, you know, takes me to my favorite place, the calf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know, I should have said the calf. The calf is amazing. It's awesome, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Man, At that sandwich was sandwich station. Yes. Yes. That was a Great. huge selling point in me coming to Hendrix because I'm just like the 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 picture of food motivated. Yeah, you know? um, I love that. All you that. can eat all yeah. the time. Yeah, man, it's a uh, it is really a great place, mm -hmm. and I feel I think that that's something that you know. Of course, it, it's got all of these these wonderful things going for it, but there are so many things that I think are are kind of slept on, and and I think the cafeteria you're in and the the <laughs> beauty of the other side of campus is definitely definitely one of them in in terms no of no one sleeps recruiting. on the calf. No, that's true. I mean, everybody everybody sings its praises. That's yeah. that's for sure. If I, mean, I hear <laughs> someone complaining about the cafeteria, I'm like, no. No, we we don't rock with calf haters around no. here. We do not rock with calf haters. Nope. So, but that's awesome, Maggie. Thank you so much for joining us. I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks. I really thank appreciate you. it. Love, this was great. Love getting the the inside scoop on tennis and yeah. the perspective of of a young coach and and hearing about the experience. So, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Cool. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so matchups with dub. <laughs> <laughs> where, did, where did that just. <laughs> that's, that's the opener. That's for this. That's the opener. Oh, man. The, uh, the Hendrix.